Okay, so we are recording and <clears throat> a couple announcements. Um, first, uh, as this semester goes on, here's my disclaimer once again, these meetings, <clears throat> chances are you're not going to find another a &P instructor that does this, that holds daily live meetings. Um, most instructors do not. I do it because I think it's good for students. A, I like teaching better in person. I think it's good for students. <clears throat> and it keeps me on task as well. Uh, it keeps me from getting lazy and just saying, okay, students are gonna read their book and then they have to take a test. Um, it makes me feel like I'm not doing my job. So if you have, <clears throat> I am currently not scheduled to teach AMP2, second summer session. I'm doing a 200 level AMP one class second summer session. But I wanted to throw this out there to you. If you're taking AMP2 um, second or third summer session and you're having difficulty and you have any questions, feel free to keep my email and just email me. I also teach AMP2 all the time. <clears throat> I'm just not doing it this summer. Um, so I can help you even, even when you have somebody else if you need uh, explanation of a topic. Um, so today we need to get right down to business because on Friday you have another quiz. I am yet, have yet to determine if Friday's quiz is going to, if we're going to make it all the way up through <clears throat> um, the section that I listed, which is 9.9. .9. Uh, if we don't get there by tomorrow, which doesn't look like we, we may, um, we, we might have to skip the smooth muscle section for the quiz and then I'll put that on a few questions on next week's quiz. We've got plenty of time to get through this. We're sort of front end loading this information. So because things get more complicated, I might do my explanations and my lectures slightly more slowly because there's more to talk about and more complicated issues. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna do a quick repeat on the muscle bending pattern. So let me call up a whiteboard. If you hear obnoxious noises in the background, it's because there's construction going on in my neighborhood. It sounds like a jackhammer to me. <clears throat> Hopefully you can't hear it. So um, this is just a really fast repeat. It's all in your book. I'm gonna quickly try to do a muscle bending pattern. What that means is within a myofibril, we talked about this yesterday, there are myofilaments, those protein myofilaments, thick and thin filaments, and they're arranged in a very specific structural nature. So that vertical, first vertical red line that I drew is called the M line. Now I'm drawing myosin thick filaments in a horizontal pattern. So let me label this. That's called the M line. And these horizontal red stripes I'm drawing are actually myosin thick filaments. And they have globular heads on them. So I'm just going to put one or two on each. They're all over the ends of these like this. So these are myosin molecules that I'm drawing with their globular heads. Let's do another one here, here. And then actin molecules are the thin filaments that sort of overlap this business. Draw actin. They're attached by something called the Z-disc, attached to each other by something called a Z-disc. So the, the blue horizontal stripes are the thin actin filaments. <clears throat> now on this pattern, um, this is all pictured in your book as well. By the way, this is I've drawn one sarcomere. It's basically from a Z-disc to a Z-disc. That's called a sarcomere, one contractile unit of skeletal muscle. That keeps repeating itself on and on and on. So there would be more actin molecules this way, and then there would be more myosin molecules between them like this on and on and on throughout that 
<clears throat> myofibril within a single cell, a muscle fiber cell. <clears throat> now there's a banding pattern. What gives muscle, skeletal muscles their banding pattern when we look at them under a microscope is this regular overlapping arrangement of the myofilaments, okay? So if I ask you on the quiz, what gives a skeletal muscle its banding pattern? I'm just coloring this in while I'm talking. It's the, it's the regular arrangement and overlapping pattern, regular pattern of these myofilaments. It's very regularly arranged. Now I'm just gonna label uh, a couple more things that are also, we said this was the Z-disc, so let me label that. This thing here is called the Z disc because of its shape kind of looks like a zigzag pattern. <clears throat> I'm not going to label actin and myosin because that'll just mess up my drawing. Where the, the part, let me use black here, the part between the actin filaments where there are no actin filaments is called the H zone. The H zone is defined as there are no actin filaments in that area. Then where there are only myosin, so this would be the H zone. And then where there are only myosin molecules, meaning from here, one from end of myosin to end of myosin is called the A band. Okay, <clears throat> and then finally, where there is no myosin is called the I band. So from the end of myosin here to the beginning of the next myosin here is called the I band. <clears throat> now, during contraction, I'm gonna explain really briefly what happens and then I'm, we're going to do detail on that later today what happens when a muscle contracts is this these myosin heads i'm using black they reach up and they attach to actin like this and these myosin heads would attach to actin here and then the myosin heads pull the actin molecules toward the emblem like this and the, the, the same would happen in this direction so when a muscle contracts, myosin reaches up, grabs the actin molecule, and pulls it toward the M1. And the same would happen over here. In this sarcomere, the same would happen over here in this sarcomere, so on and so forth. And that's what causes the entire muscle to shorten in length. As that muscle contracts, and these actin molecules move toward the M line, what happens to this banding pattern is the H zone, which is here, it disappears, it shrinks, because what defines the H zone is where there is no actin molecules. And if actin is moving this way toward the M line until it reaches the M line, that H zone is gonna completely shrink and disappear during contraction. And the A band, because it's defined just by where myosin molecules are located from end to end of myosin molecules, the A band remains unchanged during contraction because myosin molecules don't shorten or move. It's the actin molecule so A band remains unchanged during contraction. The H zone shrinks and disappears. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to layer on another board here. We need to move on. I have a list of things that I wanna cover. Hopefully I'll get to them. So I wanted to review the banding pattern of the myofilaments, which we've done, check. So I'm just gonna layer on a new board. If you have any questions, I can go back to an old board. <clears throat> the second thing that I want to talk about is, is the generation of an action potential on the sarcolemma of a muscle cell. <clears throat> <clears throat>
This is going to get uh, a bit detailed. We're trying to simplify it. Your book gets crazy detailed and the language might get confusing. So the sarcolemma of a muscle cell is just the plasma membrane of that cell. When a nerve cell, there's the end of a nerve cell, transmits its, actually what it does is it releases chemical that binds to this muscle cell. This is a, this is a muscle cell. When that chemical, that nerve, it's called neurotransmitter, when it binds to the muscle cell, that chemical, it causes an electrical stimulus called an action potential along the membrane of the sarcolemma, the membrane of the muscle cell. How that happens is this. It's, it's called the generation, I'm gonna explain this, the generation of, that's OV, of an action potential Whenever you see that action potential, just think electrical stimulus, okay? So that's what that means. I'm gonna abbreviate it. The generation of an action potential across the sarcolemma. That's the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. Here's what happens. When <clears throat> the binding, so I'm gonna put a colon here, the name of that neurotransmitter, that chemical up here that's released, is called acetylcholine. It's a long word. Sorry, I need my eraser. This acetylcholine is the name of the specific neurotransmitter that the body uses to stimulate skeletal muscle cells. We abbreviate, we can abbreviate acetylcholine as capital A-C-H. So I'm not gonna write this long word out every time that I say it or write it, I'll use the abbreviation. So the binding of acetylcholine <clears throat> on what's called the motor end plate of the muscle cell. That's just this indented portion here. So the binding of acetylcholine on the motor end plate of the skeletal muscle, I'm just gonna put a muscle fiber. It causes this electrical impulse along the sarcolemma. <clears throat> this is complicated, but I'm going to simplify it for you. What happens is this neurotransmitter, I'm going to say, this is the neurotransmitter. It's just a chemical, and it's diffusing across this space here. When it actually binds to the surface of the muscle cell, there's receptors here that it binds to. When that happens, chemically gated, they're called ligand, that's just think protein. That word ligand is a signaling protein. Chemically gated ligand channels open and allow sodium ions, sodium is Na plus, sodium ions to rush into the muscle fiber cell. This is complicated. <clears throat> we call that act of sodium rushing into the muscle fiber, that's called depolarizing the membrane. We're gonna talk more about polarization and depolarizing when we study the nervous system. Your book gets a little too complicated with this topic before you even know what it means. We'll study it more in depth <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the nervous system. So I don't expect you to be an expert on what depolarization means. It's when sodium enters a cell 
a polarized membrane. When sodium enters, it causes depolarization of that membrane. Basically think of it as an electrical stimulus along the membrane, all right? <clears throat> so I'm gonna layer on top of this. Finally, I'm just continuing. Repolarization of the muscle membrane. I'm going to say of the sarcolemma. Occurs next. And that is when potassium ions rush out of the cell. I hate to say this. Um, if you can understand this from your book reading, great. But for, I'm just going to ask you a few questions on the next quiz about this. If you can just memorize, and I'll give you some hints. Let me go back to my previous board. If you can just memorize that during depolarization, sodium rushes into the muscle fiber. And then during repolarization, potassium rushes out of the muscle cell. So think sodium in depolarization, potassium out is repolarization. We're gonna learn how that works when we study the nervous system, okay? The last thing I'm gonna say about repolarization is during this time, during this event of repolarization, <clears throat> the muscle fiber will not respond to another stimulus from the nerve. This is called refractory period. I'm gonna write from the neuron. During refractory period, or during repolarization, that's when refractory period occurs. It's sort of like the, the cell is busy doing something else and so it won't respond to another nerve stimulus, okay? <clears throat> that's complicated business. That's as much as I'm gonna expect you to know is what I've written right here. What's more important to me about how a muscle cell works is what's called the excitation contraction coupling and the cross bridge cycling, which is what I'm gonna do uh, next. And it's gonna take a little time, but I'll go slowly and explain this as simply as I can, okay? So now I'm gonna start telling you the whole story of how a muscle cell behaves when it is stimulated by a nerve cell. So I'm gonna draw a really big muscle fiber cell This is the nerve cell called the neuron that is stimulating that cell. So notice there's no physical touching between the neuron, the nerve cell, and the muscle fiber, the muscle cell. That space is called the synaptic cleft. The reason it's called the synaptic cleft is because this junction between nerve and muscle is called the synapse. The synaptic cleft is just that space. Now, this is a, a detailed story and I'm gonna go very slowly. Just picture it like you're telling a story. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And if you think of this as just telling a story, it'll be easier for you to memorize that story or remember that story. <clears throat> um, the quiz is, I'm gonna ask you questions like I always do, it's just gonna be a normal quiz, but especially with this complicated material, you're not going to have time to look up all the answers to these quizzes because they're so complicated, they're gonna to be tough to find. So it will really help you if you just learn this story and try to remember it as best you can. So I'm going to start at the beginning. A nerve impulse called an action potential travels down this neuron. There it is. 
when it reaches the end area of this neuron that looks like Bart Simpson's foot, this bulgy area of the neuron, when the action potential reaches the end, it causes calcium ions out here, outside of the cell, to rush in. So we've got electrical impulse, calcium goes in. When calcium ions influx into the neuron, there are bubbles inside of here called vesicles that contain the chemical acetylcholine. That's our neurotransmitter. So I'm going to draw the acetylcholine as just little dots. That's the chemical, the neurotransmitter. It's stored in the nerve cell in these vesicles. When calcium enters this nerve cell from this electrical stimulus, it causes these vesicles to release the neurotransmitter. So a vesicle comes to the edge and it releases the acetylcholine. So there is acetylcholine being released from the nerve cell. That's the chemical. That acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft and it binds to receptors on the motor end plates of the muscle fiber. When that acetylcholine binds to these receptors, I just briefly explained what happens. It causes protein channels called chemically gated ligand channels along this membrane to open up. And when they open up, sodium ions that are located out here rush into the cell. So when this chemical binds here to receptors, technically these are ligands themselves, they start the whole process and they cause sodium ions then to rush in. That is propagated from ligand to ligand all along the sarcolemma of this muscle cell. What we're doing is we're generating a depolarizing electrical stimulus along the muscle cell membrane. So it kind of goes like this, electrical, chemical, and then electrical again. So we get electrical stimulus at the nerve cell, it releases a chemical that causes a new electrical stimulus along the membrane of the muscle cell. When that electrical stimulus along the along the surface of the muscle cell gets transmitted inward to the inside of the cell by these T-tubules that I'm drawing right now. Their T-tubules are just organelles that conduct an electrical impulse to the interior of the muscle cell like this. So that electrical stimulus travels down this tube. When it gets to the end of that tube, it causes, remember at the end of this tube are these sacs of stored calcium called terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So these red bulging sacs that I'm drawing associated with each T-tubule, they contain calcium ions, they store calcium ions. When this electrical impulse travels down the T-tubule, it causes proteins on the surface of that T-tubule to change their shape, and then calcium ions are released, flooding the inside of the cell. Calcium has two pluses, not just one. It's a stronger ion. So that's our first goal. I'm going to repeat this again really quickly. Nerve impulse action potential travels down the nerve cell here. It causes calcium ions to go into the nerve cell. That causes acetylcholine to be released from these stored vesicles. And it dif acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft. That acetylcholine chemical binds to receptors 
ligands on the motor end plate of the muscle fiber. <clears throat> when acetylcholine binds to these protein receptors, it causes sodium ions to rush into the cell. All along the surface of the cell, sodium rushes in. That act is depolarizing the membrane and causing an electrical stimulus along the muscle membrane. The electricity, the action potential, is guided inward by these T tubules. When that action potential reaches this area called the triad, where there's two terminal cisternae storing calcium, calcium from that electrical stimulus, calcium is caused to be released into the muscle cell. I know, that's complicated. What happens to this calcium? What is the purpose of this influx of calcium is what I'm going to describe next, okay? I know it's complicated. You may need to watch this video several times. So here's what happens when calcium enters the cell. Let me go back to this page really quickly. I'm gonna to describe to you what I'm about to draw next. We're looking inside of a muscle fiber cell here on the inside, that's what I've drawn. Now I'm gonna magnify the interior of the cell even more. So I'm gonna make it bigger. And when I do that, what we're gonna see is this. I'm gonna magnify these myofilaments in a sarcomere that now we know what they are. Here's an M line. I'm just gonna draw one myosin molecule with one globular head to make it simple, to make it easy. Next, I'm gonna draw an actin molecule associated with it. Actin looks like a chain of beads, sort of like a beaded necklace that's been strung out. Let's label this business. This is myosin. And this is actin. The thick filament and the thin filament, myosin and actin. This is how they're arranged, magnified a gazillion times. This is how they're arranged inside of a muscle fiber. Our goal is to get the myosin head to reach up and grab actin, an active site on actin that allows myosin to bind to it. And then, of course, you know that this, the rest of the story is we want to pull this actin molecule toward the M line. That's what a contraction is. It's complicated, but this is how it works. Let me erase that. When a muscle is relaxed, myosin cannot bind to actin because there is a molecule called tropomyosin. It looks like a grapevine, and it's wrapped around this actin molecule and what what it's doing is it's covering the active sites so that myosin can't bind to actin so this stick this grapevine is called tropo myosin its function is you've i've already written this down in another video it blocks the active sites on actin so that myosin cannot bind to actin. And we've got another uh, uh, fourth element here. On tropomyosin are these little tabs. So I'm gonna draw, the, draw these little green tab-like structures. I don't know what colors your book uses when they explain this. I'm limited to my colors that I have on this app on my tablet. So these green things are called troponin. Uh, they have the ability to bind with calcium. So if I go all the way back to this picture, remember, all of this nerve stimulation story that we just went over, the end of that story is the release of calcium 
from the terminal cisterna into the interior of the cell. So that I'm going to show you now, let me get rid of, I'm going to show you now what calcium does. So we go back here. Let's just say calcium was just released. It's all over the inside of this cell. Calcium ions bind to this molecule, troponin. When calcium binds to troponin, it, it changes the shape of this whole molecule, causing it to lift off of actin and exposing the active sites on actin so that myosin can bind to actin. So the whole point of calcium ions being released from those storage sacs is to bind with troponin molecules and that lifts tropomyosin off of actin. So there's no longer active sites being blocked. Now they're open. And now myosin has the ability to reach up, grab this actin molecule, and pull it toward the end line. That's complicated, but it's a story that I want you to review, and I'm going to ask you some questions about the sequence of events of this. So, without further ado, let's do this. This will help you. This action potential travels down the nerve cell. When it gets to the end of the neuron, it causes calcium ions to enter the nerve cell. That causes acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter, to be released from vesicles, and it, the acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to these ligand receptors on the muscle fiber cell. When the acetylcholine binds to these ligand receptors, that causes sodium ions to rush into the muscle fiber cell. That's sodium rushing in, remember, is depolarization. Depolarization is just a fancy word for causing electrical stimulus to happen. So now we've got an electrical stimulus on the sarcolemma of the muscle cell. When that is guided inward down a T-tubule, it, it causes a protein to change shape on the T-tubule and calcium to be released into, calcium floods the inside of this muscle cell. It comes out of storage in massive quantities. So then when that calcium comes out of the cell, here it is, calcium can now bind to troponin, that little green tab, that lifts tropomyosin off of actin so that myosin can bind to actin and pull it toward the M line, cause a muscle contraction. That's the whole story. I know it's long and complicated. You can re review this video and read the book Always, always, always read the book. People, students who read the book always do better than students who don't. That's step one. Then my job is to try to explain as best I can the complicated events that are described in the book. My job, one of my jobs, is to try to explain that in a bit more direct, easy fashion for you to understand. So review this several times. The last bit, complicated bit, of this story is where does this myosin head get its energy to pull actin? How does that happen? So that's what I'm going to explain in the next picture. That when, when myosin binds to actin, that's called forming a cross bridge. So I'm going to layer on a new page what your book calls the cross bridge cycle. What that means is 
when my sin attaches to actin and pulls it toward the M line. Okay. <clears throat> Here's a myosin molecule. <clears throat> Here's our energy friend ATP. <clears throat> ATP is going to be the source to give myosin the energy to actually do the work, to pull, to pull the actin molecule, all right? <clears throat> when, here's an ATP molecule, so it's necessary for muscle contraction because it's going to give the myosin head the energy to pull. When ATP attaches to myosin, it attaches like this. There's an ATP molecule that has just attached to myosin. Remember, at the very beginning of this course, I said ATP, when it splits its terminal phosphate, it gives something energy. And that's gonna come back to haunt us now. ATP splits terminal phosphate to give energy. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna here's an ATP molecule. You don't have, I'm not gonna test you on this. Um, <clears throat> here's, let's just say here that I'm not going to draw the whole molecule. Here's three phosphates on ATP. It stands for adenosine triphosphate. When this last phosphate molecule splits off, we get ADP, adenosine diphosphate, plus P. That gives energy. All right? So this ATP molecule that is attached itself here it's going to split its terminal phosphate. And when it does, it's going to give myosin head energy. And when that myosin head gets energy, it switches position from this sort of closed head position to an open head position. So that ADP and P are still attached. ADP plus P, but the myosin head has gone from this position to an open position, like I've drawn over here to the right. <clears throat> now this myosin head can reach up, grab the actin molecule, And in this open position, so here's the sequence of events. We started here, here's one, here's two, now I'm drawing three, and during picture three what happens is the myosin head attaches to the ADP, sorry, the actin molecule, And it pulls it from the energy it got from AT, ATP. It can pull, it moves its head from open position to closed position again. It goes from here to here, and that pulls this molecule this way. So here are the key elements from this cross bridge cycle. First and foremost, I'll expect you to know. Where does myosin head get its energy? From ATP. When the ATP, it attaches to the myosin head, 
And when it splits off its terminal phosphate, that myosin head sort of cocks like cocking the trigger on a gun or that, that little thing on a gun that you pull back. Now it has energy. So we've gone from step one to step two. Now it has energy. It reaches up, grabs actin. And because it ha has energy, we go to step three and it pulls actin in this direction. So ATP gives energy. The splitting of ATP is what actually cocks the myosin head. Then it reaches up, grabs actin, pulls it toward the M line. And then when that ADP and P release from that used up myosin, only then can myosin release itself from the actin molecule and the whole story starts all over again. That's called the cross bridge cycle. Very complicated. And um, I highly recommend you review that story several times as well. Um, last bit today is, I'm just looking at my list of items that I wanted to cover. There it is. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how a muscle generates tension. <clears throat> so, before I do that, it's, I'm layering on a new board here. <clears throat> The duration of a muscle strain right contraction depends on three main things. And you'll understand this now because you, we just went through those complicated stories. So the duration, how long a muscle can stay contracted depends on, first, the duration of the stimulus from the nerve cell. I'm going to say from the neuron. So if a nerve cell keeps stimulating the muscle fiber, we can sustain a longer contraction. So that's the first criteria. Second, the duration depends on the presence of free calcium ions in the muscle cell. So I'm going to say in the sarcoplasm, that just means the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. So first, stimulus from neuron. Second, the presence of calcium inside of the cell, the sarcoplasm, and third, now you know why this, the availability of ATP molecules. So muscle contraction really, in general, depends on these three things. The nerve stimulation, calcium ions being available inside of the muscle cell, and ATP being available. And how long the muscle can contract depends on those three things. They have to always be present in order for the muscle to contract. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you a question or two about an isotonic versus an isometric contraction. So let's get to that business. First, what this word means, isotonic, is it's a, it's a contraction type that the muscle length actually changes during contraction. So the muscle length changes during contraction and the muscle moves some sort of load. Think of lifting weights. So 
during an isotonic contraction, the muscle length changes and it moves something. There's two types of isotonic contractions. So I'm gonna put a lowercase a. There's a concentric contraction. And that's when the muscle length shortens. So I'm just gonna say muscle shortens and it moves a load, AKA lifting weights. And there's something called an eccentric con isotonic contraction. And this is when the muscle lengthens and moves some sort of load. Think about if you lift a weight, if you're doing bicep curls or something, you take a, a dumbbell weight and you lift it up, your, your muscle is, your bicep muscle is shortening during contraction. And then when you go in the opposite direction, you still have the weight in your hand, but then the muscle goes back to a long position. That's called an eccentric contraction. So there's still tension in the muscle during both of those movements, but one of them, the muscle shortens, the other, the muscle lengthens. So those are isotonic contractions. I'm running out of space here, so isometric contractions occur. Here's the definition of it is Tension is created in the muscle, but the muscle does not change in length. This is easier to demonstrate when I'm teaching in person. So it's when, um, this, this type of contraction is created when you're trying to, when we're trying to move something, move some sort of a load that is greater than the force of the muscle can produce. So the example I always give in class is during, let me just go back here, during an isotonic contraction, if I pick up a trash can and move my arm, that would be concentric and eccentric isotonic contraction. The muscle is shortening and lengthening, it's changing in, sh in length during the contraction while it's, while it's moving something, moving a load. Isometric would be if I, and I walk over to the wall and I push on the wall of the room. I can't move the wall of the room, but there's still tension being produced in my muscle. It would be like if you walked out and tried to lift up your car or something, that's ridiculous as it sounds, but there's still tension being produced in your muscles, but the muscles aren't changing in length because the load, the weight of the load exceeds the amount of tension that the muscle can produce. So those are some, like, some language that I'm going to ask you of just a couple questions on the next quiz. Also, we know what a tendon is from connective tissue. So I'm going to define a tendon again. This is fibrous connective tissue that attaches or connects muscle to bone. When we use the word tendon, these are usually uh, rope like in shape. This word, apo, that's an N, A P A P O N E U R O S I S, an aponeurosis is just a fancy type of tendon. It's a flat sheet like tendon that attaches flat muscles to bone, like your abdominal muscles or, your, or the muscles over your cranial plates on your head and over your forehead. Those are flat muscles that still need to be attached to bone. 
So if you see this word in your textbook, it just means a flat sheet like tending. <clears throat> also, a myoblast. When we talk about skeletal muscles, we've already defined that skeletal muscle fiber cells are multinucleate. They have more than one nucleus. This is sort of how that comes to be. This is the derivation of that. So we know what the word blast means, right? And we know what the prefix myo means. So these are immature muscle cells. So that's what a myoblast is. And that fuse together when they are young, they fuse together to give a mature muscle fiber cell many nuclei. That's a mature fiber. multiple nuclei. So when muscle cells are young, when they're myoblast, there's their single nucleus in a single cell. But then as, as they fuse together to form a mature muscle fiber cell, that's how the muscle fiber gets more than one nucleus. Now myoblast cells that don't fuse together when they're young, If they don't fuse, they become a different type of muscle cell called a myosatellite cell. If they don't fuse, they become myosatellite cells, and these cells specifically help in muscle repair. So when we tear a skeletal muscle, which is not very repairable by the way, but what, what repair does get done is largely aided by, I'm just gonna say aid in muscle repair. So we've defined two different types of contractions, isotonic, isometric, and there's two subcategories to isotonic. We've uh, revisited tendon, aponeuroses, myoblast cells. And the last bit, the last five minutes of today, I'm just going to uh, briefly describe how a muscle can generate a different force of contraction. So think of this, when, a, when you need to lift up a pencil, you don't need to generate a whole lot of force in your hand and your arm. But if you lift up something that weighs 40 pounds, or something extremely heavy like a loaded backpack, your arm and hand and back need to generate a lot of force. Sort of how do, you, how do your muscles do that? How do, you, how do your appendages, your nervous system, and your muscle system work together to generate varying degrees of force? The force of a muscle contraction is affected, it's supposed to be AFF, affected basically by four factors. So what we're doing here is we're varying the degree of a muscle contraction, the tension that it produces. First, the number of fibers stimulated in that muscle. So for a very weak contraction, we have fewer fibers that are stimulated in a particular muscle. If we need to generate more force, more strength, what happens is more fibers in that muscle get recruited to start contracting. Secondly, the size of fibers in the muscle. So 
smaller fibers generate less tension. Larger fiber fibers can generate more tension. So if we only recruit or stimulate small fibers in a muscle, that would be like lifting up a napkin or a pencil, something like that. In order to lift uh, something of greater weight, we need to recruit larger fibers, not only more fibers, but larger fibers as well. <clears throat> Three, the frequency of stimulation. When we lift something very light that doesn't need many fibers or large fibers, it also doesn't require, I'm gonna put stimulation from neuron, it also doesn't require very frequent stimulation from the nerve cell. As we try to lift something that's a lot heavier, we need more fibers recruited, larger fibers recruited, and the nerve cell has to fire more frequently as well. And finally, number four, the degree, this one's, the first three are fairly easy to understand what those mean. The degree of muscle stretch dictates to somewhat how strong or how much tension a muscle can produce. What this means is there is an optimal length of a muscle prior to contraction that produces the greatest tension. Just give me a second to write this out. And then I'll give you a real life example. That's tension, T-E-N-S-I-O-N. -S if, if you, um, you can do a simple experiment with this at home, if you'd like, it's not really worth it, but I'm gonna just, I'm gonna uh, get rid of, I don't wanna get rid of my whiteboard or I'll erase everything that I've done. What this means is that there's an ideal length prior to contraction that, uh, that produces the greatest amount of tension. If your arm is stretched out completely, so completely, like as, as straight as it can be, it's, it's sort of what's considered slightly overstretched and it's difficult to start generating force from that fully stretched out position to bend your arm. Likewise, if your arm is almost completely flexed, it doesn't produce a whole lot of force as well. So if your arm is say two thirds extended, that's when your arm can produce the greatest amount of tension in the muscle. So, so a muscle can be slightly overstretched or slightly too contracted prior to contraction um, that, that reduces the amount of tension that the muscle can produce. These three are fairly straightforward and easy to understand. The fourth one, now you know what it means, is just that a muscle can be either too stretched out or too contracted prior to the contraction <clears throat> that will affect its amount of tension that is produced. Last two terms and then we'll call it a day. hypertrophy and atrophy. Hypertrophy refers to um, basically a muscle getting bigger from working out, from stimulating it. So I'm gonna write <clears throat> hypertrophy is the enlargement of a muscle due to <clears throat> stimulation <clears throat> so just picture that is you know people who work out with weights their muscles get bigger what's going on 
Likewise, if you take the stairwell every day rather than ride the elevator, that also stimulates your muscles and they become more toned and slightly larger. This is due to an increase. What we, we don't increase the number of muscle fibers in the muscle. We increase the number of myofibrils within each fiber. So we increase the number of myofibrils. That's what gets bigger inside of each fiber. So students ask me that occasionally, what causes a muscle to get bigger when somebody works out? <clears throat> it's an increase in the number of myofibrils, not in the number of actual fibers in the muscle. Atrophy is the opposite. This is the, a decrease in muscle size. Think of somebody who's bedridden every, all day. Decrease in muscle size due to lack of use or lack of stimulation. So picture um, the person who's bedridden either from disease or from injury. That's why physical therapists need to go in and work that person's muscles in order to keep them from <clears throat> disintegrating, from uh, undergoing severe use. Long-term atrophy can be permanent. Temporary atrophy is reversible. Picture yourself, you, you, you break um, a bone, in your forearm radius or your ulna, you have to be in a cast for, for six months or even four to six months, a large amount of atrophy occurs. If you've ever had a cast, you, you, you've experienced this. Um, the size of your arm gets smaller, not only because of reduction in bone mass, but also in muscle mass. But temporary, meaning over the course of a, a few weeks or a few months, that type of atrophy is reversible. Long-term atrophy is somebody is bedridden for months to years. What happens is the actual fibers die and that is permanent. Um, the long-term atrophy is permanent and, and cannot be regained. All right, guys, I'm going to leave you there. We've, we've filled up our, our space. Um, we'll erase some of this business. If you put my tablet back up here. If you guys have any questions, you can ask me now. I'm just going to cut off my recording. There, I've stopped recording.